Hi, it's Miss Dowling, and today we have another biography. This one's going to look a little different, but in case you missed my first lesson on biographies, I'm going to do the same thing. The word bio means life, and the part of the word graphy or graphy means the study of. So a biography has to do with studying someone's life. Now, first we read this biography of George Washington. It was organized like most nonfiction books where there are facts on each page, some captions maybe, an index, things like that. But the biography I have for you today is also about George Washington, but it is in a narrative nonfiction format, which means that it's still nonfiction, but it's told like a story. So you'll notice that um, when I open it up, there is no table of contents. It goes right into the book. At the end of the book, there is no glossary. There is no index. There is a note from the author. So it's going to be different looking. It's still true. Everything I'm going to read to you is absolutely true. It's just told like a story. So that's called narrative nonfiction, which I do a lot of in my lessons because it's really important. Okay, I'm going to back my screen away. So it's a big book. This is called Big George, How a Shy Boy Became President Washington. Written by Anne Rockwell, illustrated by Matt Fellin. Three hundred years ago, there was no United States of America. Instead, there were 13 English colonies in North America. In the one called Virginia, a tall boy loved to get on his horse and gallop through the woods alone. He wasn't afraid of bears or wolves or the native hunters with bows and arrows who shared those woods. George Washington wasn't afraid of anything except making conversation. He was shy. When George was 11, his father died. George's grown half-brother, Lawrence Washington, became like a father to him. At Mount Vernon, the farm where Lawrence lived, he taught George Washington everything a Virginia gentleman needed to know. Lawrence had a fine library where George read many books and especially enjoyed the stories of ancient Roman heroes. One told of a man named Cincinnatus, a Roman farmer who put down his plow to become a leader when his people called on him and returned to the plow to become a farmer again when he was no longer needed to lead. George practiced handwriting by copying from a book of manners. He memorized the sentences he copied, for he figured they were important. Remember, it was a book of manners. He understood that good manners could hide his shyness. George grew taller and stronger, and he was good at sports. Besides riding horseback, he enjoyed fencing, playing ball, and firing a musket. He also liked to hunt and decided he'd one day become a brave soldier like Lawrence, who had a fine uniform and shining sword. George would be ready in case the king ever called upon him to fight. George was also very good at drawing and mathematics. When he was 16, he became a surveyor and map maker for the king. He rode into the wilderness to measure unexplored land and draw maps of the colony. George Washington was good at many things, but he had one big fault. He never knew what to say unless he lost his temper. Then too many angry words poured out.
George grew to be six feet three inches tall and towered over everyone around him. He loved to dance at the many balls held on neighboring farms. He didn't need to talk while fiddles played. The girls he danced with said he was the best dancer in the colony of Virginia. And the handsomest, too. When George was 19, he and Lawrence sailed to Barbados, an English colony in the West Indies. They hoped that the year-round sunshine would cure Lawrence's tuberculosis. George caught smallpox and recovered, but Lawrence died shortly after they sailed home to Virginia. George inherited Lawrence's fine uniform and sword and became the master of Mount Vernon, but he missed his brother terribly. For the rest of his life, George never spoke of that heartbreaking time. George soon had a chance to use Lawrence's shining sword. In 1755, the king ordered him to fight French soldiers and American Indian tribesmen at Fort Duquesne in Pennsylvania. His leader would be the English general Edward Braddock. George knew how the American Indians fought. They hid silently behind trees, then leaped out, brandishing weapons. They usually won. French soldiers had learned to fight this way too. George told General Braddock he thought they should use the American Indian tactic of surprise attack. But Braddock insisted they march into battle in a long line, accompanied by a marching band to keep them in step. That was the English way. George lost his temper. He argued with Braddock, but had to give in. Young George Washington knew he had to obey his general. That was a rule of war. The king's army lugged heavy wagons of fine food and silver tableware through the dense forest. A band marched with them, playing stirring battle songs. The silent hidden enemies listened to the fifes and drums approaching, then leaped out from behind the trees and attacked. Most of the king's soldiers, including General Braddock, were killed that day. Those who survived spoke of the brave young giant who'd fought with them. His hat had been shot through and bullet holes had punctured his coat. He'd had two horses shot from under him, but George Washington was never wounded. He didn't forget that terrible lesson of the battle now called Braddock's defeat. He saw that real war wasn't the fun that fencing with Lawrence had been. It was tragic and bloody. George went home to Mount Vernon with his mind made up to be a farmer for the rest of his life. He married Martha Custis, a young widow with two children of her own. He found farming fascinating, loving the land and what he could make it produce and each day he galloped off on his horse to be alone in the wilderness. Peace was better than war. But war would come again to America. By 1775, the colonists had had enough of the many unfair laws the King of England had imposed on them. In Lexington, Massachusetts, fighting broke out between some colonists and the King's soldiers. The colonists won, the king was angry that his soldiers had been defeated by a bunch of shopkeepers, schoolboys, and farmers. He sent more soldiers to put down this rebellion. The colonists knew they would go on fighting, and they needed a leader. Dun, dun, 